Now on to the main event. After the video, we will have a special introduction from an AY-18 Eagle, Colonel retired Ken Cordier, who was a P Vietnam POW alongside this morning's first honoree. Uh, when he went through um, basically combat survival training, he remembered talking with an instructor about a tap code that World War II prisoners used, and uh, so just by chance he happened to learn about that, and when he was taken into captivity, he taught it to a couple of the other guys that were there. Um, and as they moved around the prisons um, in Vietnam, it spread like wildfire and uh, became a, a very key lifeline for them to communicate. Just watching him, he got more emotional thinking about how she was while he was in captivity. And I'll never forget, just very powerful, very emotional. So he uh, started out enlisted and decided he wanted to fly, so he uh, got commissioned, cross-trained into F-105s, um, and did a couple of uh, combat tours over Vietnam, and it was shortly thereafter, I believe it was his second tour, um, that he was shot down. And he was a POW for about seven years, and so one of the longer um, remaining POWs over there. Uh, came home during Operation Homecoming, uh, reunited with his family, his son, who he had never met, um, who was born after he was taken into captivity, um, his two daughters. It was actually very humbling to, to speak with him because he does not consider himself a hero. He does not consider himself worthy of being considered an eagle, and, um, which absolutely just astounds me because he and his wife are both incredible. The things that he kind of talked about, like I said, doing things for the patriotic um, you know, sense of duty and sense of country, uh, that, that resonates with me because for a lot of what we do, uh, I mean, we've known nothing but war since you know, my peer group commissioned. The optimism, um, particularly in my line of work when we talk about uh, force support and taking care of the people and the families uh, and the airmen, it's, it's important to me that we provide them with some kind of positive view of the Air Force and that's really what he maintained. was. You know, it, the situation is what you make of it. You can either kind of wallow in it or you can maintain that hope, and, and he definitely did. The fact that he and his wife took us out to lunch and treated us to all these things, like we were the ones that were important. Um, so I, I'll never forget that. Easily the best moment of ACSC for me. Good morning. Isn't it great to be alive and free? It's a privilege and an honor to introduce Smitty Harris, one of the most important and influential fellow POWs I served with in Hanoi during the Vietnam War. Our early years in prison were very difficult. We were forbidden to speak in audible tones and never permitted books or writing materials. We were locked up 24-7 and were forbidden to exercise. The windows were all bricked up because it was forbidden to ever see other POWs. A line from fellow POW Brad Smith's poem goes like, I've nothing left but memories, the rest they stripped away. In other words, we had absolutely no freedom. We were all tortured to sign war crimes confessions and to condemn the U.S. presence in Vietnam. Against this background of total repression, it was critical to be in contact with other POWs for mutual support and to organize our resistance against that unrelenting enemy. Back in the 60s, the Air Force Combat Survival School at Stead Air Force Base was located near Reno, Nevada. After a day of lectures and exercises, Many of us would drive into Reno to gamble, sin, and drink. Not a good lifestyle to get the most out of the next day of training. While Smitty stayed on base, wrote a letter home, and went to bed early every night. This paid enormous dividends when we got to Hanoi. During POW training, the instructor mentioned that in the German POW camps, prisoners would communicate between barracks by tapping on the metal water pipes which supplied water to the um, separated prisoner compounds. After class, Smitty asked the instructor, how are they able to tap dashes? 
The instructor replied that they didn't. They didn't use Morse, Morse code, but rather a five by five matrix code, leaving out one letter, unfortunately, the letter K. And once you see this, you can easily remember the key, and Smitty did. By the way, my initials are KC. They left out the K, and guys always spelled my name wrong. A couple of years later, Smitty was shot down, captured, and had a brief opportunity to be with the other five prisoners in early 1965. He used this time to teach them the TAP code. The code was then passed on to other POWs as they were brought to the Hanoi Hilton and other prisons. It became the single most significant tool to enable us to keep in contact for mutual support and enable our senior officers to provide leadership and guidance. The camp authorities eventually learned that we were somehow communicating, which of course was strictly forbidden. Unfortunately, one of the guys got careless and was caught tapping on the wall. He was taken to an interrogation, and after denying that he was tapping on the wall, he, they put him in the rope torture until he broke and revealed the name of the guy in the next cell. That guy, in turn, was tortured to give the name of the man in the cell next to him and so on until they discovered that the entire camp was connected and communicating. The men who were tortured paid a heavy price, but the positive outcome was that they, did a, they, the Vietnamese, did a complete shuffle of the entire camp and we all got new roommates. Can you imagine the frustration of being locked up 24-7 with one or two other men? It doesn't take long until you've heard all his stories and then they start over and over. So our communication net was a great boon to our survival, both physical and mental. Now, I think you can appreciate how much we owe to Smitty Harris for giving us the means to communicate and support each other in the most difficult circumstances we could ever imagine. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome my friend and comrade, Colonel Carlisle Smitty Harris, uh, and accompanied by his wife, Louise. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning, Louise, Smitty. It's such a pleasure to have you guys here today. And Ken, thank you for the uh, beautiful introduction uh, to talk about what Smitty has provided to his significant contribution to air and space power. And without further ado, Smitty, the floor is yours. Thank you. I am so honored, we are so honored, to be here as an eagle. And I know that the reason I was selected to be an eagle is that I represent Vietnam POWs, their achievements and conduct during our incarceration in North Vietnam. So, but it's such an honor to be here and represent that group. Uh, I have such great pride in being a part of that uh, resistance to our captors in North Vietnam. My talk today, of course, is going to be about some of my POW experience and my bonding with the men with whom I served. They are, weren't specially picked to be POWs, it just happened. And I respect our armed forces because all of the people in all our services would do the utmost that they could to represent their country and to do anything they could in their ability to do the things that they thought they should do. It was a uh, challenge, but we took it on willingly because we had such a background of love for our country and our service and the men with whom we served. Uh, here's a, a story I'll tell you, back in the early days of 1965, I was flying the F-105 Thud, as we call it, F-105 fighter bomber, 
and the target was a large bridge in North Vietnam. I peeled in, 45 degree dive, my airspeed was perfect, the altitude at which I pickled my bombs was perfect, my sight picture was perfect. These were dumb bombs, so you had to get everything just right up here for the bombs to hit where they should down there. At the proper altitude, I pickled off the bombs, pulled out a lot of G's, hit afterburner to get the heck out of there. The anti-aircraft fire was horrendous. That bridge was one of the most important arteries in North Vietnam. It had both vehicular and rail traffic on it and sent supplies to the south to the Viet Cong. As I pulled out, somebody shot a missile. I don't know its caliber, but uh, I took it out with my 105. <laughs> <laughs> it took out my 105, too. <laughs> it hit in the engine area. It was a single-engine airplane, of course. Uh, probably hit in the bottom of the aircraft and cut hydraulic lines and uh, communication cables and so on. I tried to advise my squadron that I had been hit, but they never received uh, a message. Very quickly, the airplane, the yaw damper system went haywire, and that F-105 at about 600 knots went woo, really yawed to the left, and out of my peripheral vision, I saw one of the big 450-gallon fuel tanks ripped from the airplane. I hit the yaw damper button to uh, turn it off and was able to get a little bit of control of the airplane, but it was decelerating rapidly with no power, and I was on fire and knew, and so I ejected from my burning aircraft. I was captured immediately on the ground because I was so close to the target area, the village over which I found myself was directly below me, and we could at, still hear following aircraft, bombs, and anti-aircraft guns going off. So the villagers were out looking, those that weren't hiding, and the first thing they saw was me or my parachute. <laughs> I was surrounded and captured immediately uh, on the ground. Mistreated immediately. They pushed me up against a broken down uh, brick wall that had been a building and formed a little firing squad. Uh, there was one particularly irate uh, North Vietnamese villager who was kind of a leader and he put three of his uh, friends who had rifles about 15 feet in front of me and he walked up to me and put his finger right here. Well, I had been stripped down to just my skivvy shorts and I knew what was happening and the only thing I could think was say a little prayer and stand as military as I possibly could and that's hard to do in your skivvies. <laughs> But at any rate, some older men pushed in between my would-be executioners because the North Vietnamese were pretty disciplined and they had been asked to capture American pilots alive for our value, for interrogation purposes, or hostages, or whatever later on. Uh, we went, I was taken to Hanoi, to an old prison we called the Hanoi Hilton, it had been built by the French in the probably the late 1850s. And I was put in a small cell about, <coughs> excuse me, about seven by seven. Had two concrete platforms for beds on each side. And at the end of each were stocks where your ankles could be locked in. A heavy wooden door with a peephole and a light that stayed on 24 hours a day. Uh, I was interrogated immediately upon getting there. They had an 
English and speaking interrogator. Um, not very good English, but at any rate, they wanted to know military information. They wanted to know my squadron, which aircraft carrier I flew from. Of course, I was Air Force. And, but at any rate, uh, tactics, future targets, uh, any kind of information that I had that might be useful. Uh, I, of course, refused to answer those. I gave them name, rank, service number, and date of birth. And uh, they didn't like that. They knocked me off my stool, kicked me, threatened me with everything. They did not use torture at that time, as we uh, defined torture. But uh, I took a pretty good beating several, several times when I would say something about the Geneva Conventions or just give them main rank service number and date of birth, they would get very angry. So those interrogation sessions really became an, uh, an opportunity for my English-speaking interrogator to practice his English. He started from the very beginning. He talked a heck of a lot more than I did, and he was telling me the history, the wonderful history of North Vietnam and of their country and how long they had uh, tried not to be overcome by invaders or the Chinese or whomever and all about communism and the wonderful things that ensued to the people from their government. It went in one ear and out the other. <laughs> we were Americans and we knew what our freedoms were and what they had didn't approach that. As a matter of fact, it opposed that. So those indoctrination sessions, we sa I sat on a stool for many hours at different times listening to their propaganda. They were trying to brainwash us, but they could not. And that was similar for all the POWs uh, who were over there. They, they simply and particularly a few months later when they really started the bad torture sessions, once one was tortured, never again would you be likely to not know who was right and who was the enemy. And from then on, you knew darn well you were going to resist anything they tried to do to you or get from you. Uh, let me, just a little bit about torture. Uh, understand that we weren't tortured all the time we were there. There were great long periods where it was really boredom. But when they wanted something from us, sometimes it was a camp wide uh, program they would come in and get each POW one by one and torture us by then we had no military information that was current enough to be of any value to them so all they wanted was submission they wanted us to submit to everything they told us and then they would require us to write some statement and of course, we refused to do that. But they used usually uh, a week or so of, of kind of softening you up by making you, forcing you to kneel or sit on a stool for days, uh, but not great, great pain, uh, deny you food and water sometimes, but finally they would do it. They would push you in tight ropes that uh, bound your head almost between your knees, your hands tied behind you, your elbows tied together, and then they would lift your arms from the back, and they would create such intense pain you could only stand a few hours of that at most. And you finally knew you had to do something, but 
before we lost all ability to think and act, when we finally said bow cow, I'm not sure how that translates, but that's what we were told to say when we wanted to communicate with them. We would maintain a second line of resistance. We would finally be forced to write something. Uh, sometimes it took a few days before we could write the nerves in our arms and hands so, so badly damaged. But I remember I finally wrote a confession one time and uh, it went something like this. Uh, we American air pirates, that's what they call us, criminal air pirates, uh, followed the orders of our government with no remorse or regret. That was my confession. And of course, at the high, they accepted that. They used the, the terms criminal air pirate. But at the highest levels of government, they knew that that was not going to, to get by as something that came from a logical reasoning POW. So the truth is they made almost no effort to use those propaganda statements they forced from us. There was one exception that I uh, know of, uh, a Navy pilot named Nels Tanner was tortured and, and forced to write a statement that people in his squadron were anti-war activists and had uh, influenced his squadron to refuse combat. The reason they wanted that, they wanted a statement to go to the War Crimes Tribunal in Stockholm headed by Bertram Russell, which was just a communist ploy, and they wanted to show that American servicemen would not follow legitimate orders. So Nels Tanner wrote in very straight English exactly the story that two of his squadron mates had refused, to, he was Navy, had refused to fly combat and had influenced his squadron not to fly combat. They really liked that letter. So they read it to the world in Stockholm at the War Crimes Tribunal. The only th problem was, well, there were a couple problems. One, how did Nels Tanner get shot down if his squadron refused to fly combat? <laughs> Number two, he named the two squadron mates that were the anti-war activists who had influenced the entire squadron. They turned out to be Dick Tracy and Clark Kent. <laughs> <laughs> when that was read to the world, Nels Tanner finally was nailed. And for a couple of years, he got special bad treatment for embarrassing the North Vietnamese, the communist world, in, on a worldwide scene. In retrospect, the torture was a huge mistake for the North Vietnamese because all it did was harden us to resist whatever they were trying to get more and more. We hated their, our treatment and those who were giving it to us and we would never submit to it. So it, in that way, it backfired against them. Also, they could never let an independent group of any kind, the International Red Cross or anyone else, interview any of us because they would get the wrong answers. So we were, we were never interviewed by friendly the, uh, Red Cross or anyone else. So in that way, they denied themselves the ability to get legitimate and believable propaganda, which they so much desired. Uh, Ken has talked about our capping on the wall and um, how it spread like wildfire through our camps. 
uh, because it was so important. It was, it, communication was so important between us because we had to know who was the senior ranking officer and with our communication, we were able to find out what the North Vietnamese were trying to get out of each of us and pass it along. The North Vietnamese would try to play one POW against another and tell one POW that so-and-so told us something and play us against each other. But with our communication, we knew that that was just a ploy. Uh, we also were able to pass information back and forth between ourselves and with know who the senior ranking officer was and get direction from him. So we would have a common effort when we went to interrogation to answer questions in a certain way, for instance. Also, our communication system permitted us to get information from our family and friends back home and from our squadron mates because from later shoot downs. I had been there uh, about six months when my squadron commander, uh, uh, Colonel Robbie Reisner, came up to Hanoi to see me and see how I was doing. <laughs> and there were, it turned out there were six of my squadron who were POWs, and uh, I found out that my wife and two little girls were living in Okinawa when I was sent over to Karate Air Base to fly missions. And uh, I found out that my wife had a little baby boy. Well, just a month after I was shot down and that she was doing well and that she had gone back to the States and had chosen to live in Tupelo, Mississippi uh, in the same uh, town with her sister and, and their, her husband and children. I found that all out through our communication system. It was, it was wonderful to get that news from late shoot downs and also what was going on in the World Series and all sorts of things back in the States. Uh, the, I cannot overblow the importance of our communication with uh, having a chain of command, increasing our morale, forming a brotherhood with our fellow POWs, increasing our resistance to the North Vietnamese, increasing our value systems. When we were alone and being tortured or, or whatever else, we knew at some point that we could not go on ourselves. We needed help. And we knew where to get that help. We prayed. When everything else failed, we prayed. And you know, we knew we had someone who was on our side. And those prayers weren't miracles that we wanted. Did not happen immediately. But we got things much more important than what we asked for. We knew we were not alone. We had increased knowledge that someone was there helping us and it increased our desire to live, to go on, to resist and come home to our own free country where we could worship as we wanted to. So we gained great values from that time and we maintain them today. So that communication, part of it was when we were in those conditions, 
when we would be finally dragged back to our cell, some, as soon as the guard left and it was clear, the first thing that we would hear would be, that's G B U in tap code. God bless you. We knew we had support from our friends and we shared our experiences with each other to we knew it would be valuable to them to know how to resist and what we had done. Our guidance was the Armed Forces Code of Conduct. We tried our very best to maintain that code, to do our best to follow that code and resist as best we possibly could and comply with the code at all times. And because we followed the code and we resisted, we knew that in our war with the North Vietnamese, our personal war, the POWs against our captors, we came home with pride in our group, in ourselves, and with honor because we knew we had done the very best we could possibly do and we knew that we had won our war. You know, looking back, we have no regrets. Uh, we know the net effect on our lives has been positive from that experience. We gained so much and the net effect on our lives has really been positive. Uh, thank you all, and I'm going to let questions come, and, and please direct them to, to my wife uh, <laughs> and me, <laughs> and uh, we have a few minutes left, so go ahead. We've got one over here on the uh, right side. Sir, Scott Patton, Flight 21. Can you explain to us how your time as a POW impacted uh, your post-POW Air Force career? both uh, professionally and your family? Yes. Uh, they were so good to us when we came home. Initially, we were interrogated by the good guys, wanting to know names of all the POWs that we possibly knew and inf any information we could give them. They gave us a very, very thorough physical and took care of any problems we might have. And gave us our choice of assignments if we were capable of doing that. Uh, some people <coughs> wanted to go back into flying positions and they got, were able to do so if they were physically able. Uh, I personally wanted to go to Air War College to kind of catch up on what was going on in the world and in the Air Force and kind of re-bluing back into service. So that was a great advantage. Um, I guess we were uh, treated so well and greeted so wonderfully well when we came home with huge banners and people saying, welcome home. Uh, it was a huge boost to our morale and almost uh, we didn't expect that. We knew that we had found out that many Vietnam veterans, when they came back, were very badly treated. But when we came home, the nation was almost in a euphoric stage of something good to come out of the North Vietnamese uh, war. And the release of our prisoners was welcomed so much by everyone. So we felt loved and cared for and were cared for by the armed forces and uh, our families. And we don't look back with uh, any bad images in our minds. We just look forward to a happy and wonderful life in this great country. Go ahead. Um, can you uh, maybe tell us some of the TAP code? <laughs> some others? Some of the tap code. 
Oh, the TAP code. Uh, I think most of the people here have learned it in some of their schools, but I'll give it to you very quickly. Leave out the letter K, the first line across, and you could identify any letter in that line by tapping. A, B, C, D, E was the first line. Then the second line, F, G, H, I, J. The third line, L, M, N, O, Q. But you didn't have to remember all of that because you had to remember the first letter of each line, A, F, L, Q, V. So you would identify which line, pause, and then go over to the letter. For instance, the letter M would be A, F, L, L, M. The letter A would be the letter K. One way we, uh, if we really needed K, we use C for K mostly, but if we really wanted to transmit a, a K, we would go, this is C. This was just change the cadence, and you knew it was a K. But there you have the tap code. <laughs> okay, back to the same mic again. Uh, thank you, sir, for your service. Um, it was a very uh, powerful story that you're sharing. Um, had a question for your wife. What did the military do uh, during that time of your capture, and what kind of support did she have? Actually, I had very good support, except on a few occasions when I just had to uh, be, as my teachers used to say, a little cheeky, and I had to just demand certain things, and I did. Uh, I had great respect and great help from my uh, casualty officers. But as long as I was in Okinawa, the squadron was wonderful to me. And they, they were fighting on the, uh, that front over there. But the wives and the, and the squadron, when they were uh, back from rotation, took great care of me, truly, and helped me with the children and helped me as long as I was in Okinawa. And I, I stayed there until our son was born and then until he was six, week, uh, six weeks old. And Colonel Cardenas, who was the base commander, Wing later, commander. Uh, wing commander, excuse me, and then later General Cardenas. Uh, he would come to my house if he had some information that was classified. If necessary, he would bring it, bring it to my house. I mean, they were wonderfully kind and took great care of me. When I got back to the States, I had a little trouble with, frankly, the Secretary of the Air Force. And uh, <laughs> uh, I had to demand, he was just going to give me $350 of Smitty's pay. And I told him that I could not live on $350 and, uh, and support our children, which was my husband's wish. And the women in the audience who came to the tea yesterday know this, but I just said, I'm sorry, I won't do that, and I have the papers, and I can sell the children if I need to, <laughs> but uh, I'm, I have to have our full allotment, and I have all the necessary documents to do that, and he told me he'd get back to me in a week, and I said, no, it will be this afternoon, and, uh, and he said, well, Miss Harris, I have to think about this because this is my policy, and I said, well, I'm sorry, but my policy is that I have to have sleep because I have three babies, and uh, I will have to have an answer by 5 o'clock this afternoon. And to his credit, he called me back before 5 o'clock that afternoon and said, Miss Harris, I've thought about it, and you're right, and uh, I'll, you will have your full husband's full pay and allotments. And I said, thank you very much, and I will not call a press conference after all. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, mostly everything, the only other, pro <laughs> and this was funny, I had been finally, I would moved four times to get a house that was livable in next door to my sister, 
And I'd been settled there happily for a while, and the Air Force called and said, we have a great deal for you. We have housing available, and I think it was Minot they wanted to send me to <laughs> and uh, take my housing allowance. And I said, are you nuts? <laughs> I said, I'm, I'm living next door to my sister in Tupelo, Mississippi, in a wonderful house, in a warm climate, and you want to send me my not? And they said, oh, it's going to be great. There are going to be a lot of wives there in the same situation you're in. And I said, forget it, fella. I'm not going. <laughs> <laughs> so, But mostly everything they did, and if I needed something, I could call someone and say, hey, I need this. If I had a situation, I just found that if I called the top man available and said, this is the way it's going to be, they just said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> tell them about, your, tell them about uh, your car you ordered. Oh, one other story, and the, and the wives have heard this, but um, while we were in Okinawa, I had to sell the house that we had and also my car. And they had a great program in Okinawa. You could order a General Motors car over there and have it delivered at any port in the country. You didn't have to pay tax, and it was a great price. So I ordered a stripped-down Chevy wagon. I could afford that. So it was supposed to be delivered in the port of New Orleans, which was, I could get on a Trailways bus in Tupelo, Mississippi, leave the kids with my sister and her teenagers, and go to the port of New Orleans, pick up the car, and be home the same day which was great with my sister. She was not thrilled about having three little biddies running around. So anyway, uh, when I got the call that the port, the car had come into the port, uh, I said, oh, that's wonderful. My sister is really tired of me borrowing her car. So they said, and it's in the port of Baltimore. And I said, oh, no, no, it's supposed to be in the port of New Orleans. and. Uh, they said, sorry, it's in the port of Baltimore. Click. So I stewed over that for a little bit, and uh, so finally I thought, hmm, General Motors car. So I picked up the black rotary phones that we had back then and called the Mr. Estes, who was chairman of the board of General Motors, and I called him collect. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> While, while talking over the operator to explain why I was calling him collect, and he said, who, what, in where? And they usually said Tupelo, Mississippi. Uh, but anyway, he finally said, okay, I'll just take the call. So he did, and he listened to my tale of woe, and finally he said, Miss Harris, I'm so sorry about your situation, and he said, let me tell you what I'm going to do. He said, do you have a, a General Motors dealer in Tupelo, Mississippi? <laughs> and I said, yes, I do. And it's just down the corner, and turn right, and turn right again, and, and there he is. And he said, you go there, and you give him my name and this code and my number, and you pick out any General Motors station wagon on that lot, and it's yours. And I said, well, I don't mind paying the difference. I've just got to have a car. And he said, you don't have to pay anything extra. That car is yours. Anyone you want on that lot that's a station wagon is yours, courtesy of General Motors. So I went down to George Ruff Buick Olds, and they had one station wagon on that lot. And it was a loaded Buick station wagon. <laughs> And I got in that Hummer, and I thanked George Ruff and told him I was a General Motors customer. And uh, <laughs> I drove that yellow Buick station wagon home, and I drove the wheels off that car, <laughs> and uh, it was wonderful. So I really found myself to be a very fortunate person over the years, and uh, people were very kind to me, and I tried not to whine at anybody. But if I had a problem, I just said, hey there, who are you, top person? And I went real straight to them. <laughs> so life, life turned out pretty good, particularly when I got this fellow back. We'll uh, go to the young man over here to the right. Did any of your friend POWs es try to escape? Uh, yes, they did. Um, 
There were a few attempts, but uh, one incident, two of our POWs, uh, it was obviously a planned escape because they had to uh, get, they had prepared for days, they got out of the camp, they were captured immediately the next day and brought back to camp and tortured to find out everything about the planning and anything about anything that they want, the North Vietnamese wanted to know. Uh, one of those men was tortured to death. His name was Atterbury. Uh, the other's name was Dramisi. He survived, but as a result of that escape attempt, the North Vietnamese went to all the camps and tortured people in every camp to try to find out if we had other escape plans. And so our leadership, our senior ranking officers, passed the word out that there would be no more escape attempts unless you had knowledge, good knowledge, that you were gonna get outside support from our own forces or, or whatever. Uh, but continue with every effort to make escape plans so that that can ever occur, you'll be prepared. So that's the answer to your question. There were no more escape attempts after that. Okay, up here to the right again. Hey, good morning. Thank you very much for coming and sharing your story, both of you. It's very inspirational. Um, you spoke a little bit about uh, finding out in captivity that you had a son. Could you go through the specifics of how you got that and the emotions you were going through when you got that information? Oh, it was wonderful. Uh, Major Larry Garino, who was in another squadron, is the one who passed it through our communication system. Uh, he was shot down, I think, about three months after I was. But uh, he knew that a wife in the, his sister's squadron had given birth to a child and they were doing well. And so he passed to me, he knew I had two daughters, he passed to me that uh, I had a son and the mother and, and son were both doing well. It was months later after my squadron mates came there <laughs> and verified that Louise and our son were doing well and I finally got in communication again with Larry Garino, and he confessed. He said, Smitty, I didn't know the sex of your child, but I knew you had two daughters, and I thought you had worn a son, and I wanted to cheer, <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to cheer you up. Uh, I forgave him for, for doing that. question that I have, Smitty, is what, um, who and while you were all detained as prisoners uh, had a significant effect on you to have your morale um, up during those torture sessions and whatnot uh, and was able to help provide that leadership through the prison system have the most significant impact on you? Do you mean the, the uh, names of some of our leaders or? Yeah, so I remember we spoke briefly um, during the interview about uh, wow. during particular sessions that were challenging that you would be able to picture Robbie Reisner sitting oh. next to you. Can you speak to that a little bit? I had a wonderful squadron commander, Colonel Robbie Reisner. He was a MIG ace in Korea, a wonderful leader, a Christian, who lived his Christian life, he was, he was one of those people that if as soon as you met him, you knew that he was a very, very special person. It just exuded confidence, leadership, and just the kind of man that you would follow anywhere. Uh, he, w he was really my idol. Uh, I was a very senior captain, soon to be major, uh, 
which happened while I was a POW. And I just looked up to Robbie Reisner. Uh, he's the one that joined me six months later <laughs> in, in the Hanoi Hilton. But in those early interrogation se sessions where they were getting pretty darn rough with me, I put a stool right beside my stool and I put Robbie Reisner on that stool in my mind and I tried to act as I thought Robbie Reisner would expect me to act. Uh, that's how much respect I had for that man. We had wonderful leadership in North Vietnam and uh, uh, Stockdale, Admiral Stockdale was one, Jeremiah Denton, uh, there were just lots of men who stepped up and took a leadership role when it was their turn to do so or they were the senior ranking officer of a camp or finally at Camp Unity when we were all brought back to the Hanoi Hilton after the San Tay raid in November of 1970. But we had wonderful leadership and we wanted that and it made us feel as a unit, it gave us a spree and we had a purpose uh, for being there. Is that? That was pretty good, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, one other question that I'll ask and I think the audience is probably curious, but uh, Miss Louise, how, um, once you got the news that Smitty was returning and coming back, can you guys both kind of share your experience of unifying your family and then also Smitty for you to meet Lyle for the first time? You go first. Well, I expected that the Air Force would send Louise to Hawaii <laughs> and me to Hawaii when we came out. And we would have a short time together to find out about what was going on in the family and whatnot to reunite. It didn't happen that way. <laughs> we came from Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines, landed at Travis Air Force Base in California, and came to a base that was nearest to our home, which happened to be Maxwell Air Force Base for me. And there, at two o'clock in the morning on February the 16th, uh, 1973, uh, I was, I guess there were about 15 or 20 of us on the airplane that were coming back to Maxwell because of the hospital facilities here. And our families were here in, over in the BOQ. And so at two o'clock in the morning, I landed and because I was the senior person on that flight, of course, it's, I came down the steps, there were glaring lights and they put a microphone in front of me and I probably tried to say something appropriate. I didn't know it, but right behind me, a car had pulled up and I said just a brief couple of words and I turned around and with the lights shining on me, right into the, the car and on the back seat, that's from the first time I saw Louise she was in the back seat of that staff car. And so I went around, we jumped in and hugged. Uh, we went to the BOQ. Uh, I didn't get to spend any other time <laughs> alone with Louise <laughs> right then uh, because back at the BOQ, uh, my mother and father were there, my brother, Louise's mother and grandmother, her sister and their two children uh, both our staff officers, uh, whom else? Uh, a medical officer, uh, a chaplain. Uh, I don't know, I thought there were a thousand people in that room, <laughs> frankly, <laughs> and our children. But so. the two girls remembered me, and they came up and, of course, hugged and on me, and they were excited. Uh, my, I picked up my son, he was almost eight years old, and gave him a big hug. He didn't hug back, but that didn't bother me because I, 
I knew he didn't know I was a total stranger. He had never seen me before. But after that, uh, he went over and I kind of lost track of what was going on because we were exchanging presents. I had bought in the Philippines a bunch of nice watches and Mickey Moto pearls for the ladies and so on. And they had presents for me and we were exchanging them. And I looked over in the corner and my son Lyle was sitting in an easy chair looking and I put my hands out like this. He came and jumped up. That's the total time it took for me to adjust to my family and my son whom I had never seen. <laughs> uh, from then on, we were just family. We loved each other. The kids, we corrected them when they needed it. They complied. <laughs> and we also <laughs> and we gave them a lot of love and, and care. So it was a wonderful, wonderful homecoming uh, for me. Thank you. Thank you again. Okay. Thank all you. Right. Thank you. Thank you all.